Do the Dallas Cowboys have the best edge rusher room in the NFL? All that and more in this episode of Locked On Cowboys Podcast. You are Locked On Cowboys, your locked daily Dallas Cowboys on. podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast locked Network, your on. team every locked, day. Locked, locked, on. Locked, locked, locked On. Locked On. Locked On Cowboys. Welcome back to the Locked On Cowboys podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We'd like to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. I am your host, Marcus Mosher. You can follow me on Twitter at Marcus underscore Mosher. Joining me today, as always, is Landon McCool. Check him out on Twitter at McCoolBCB. Today, we are taking a look at the Cowboys' edge rusher room going into the 2023 season. Uh, And before we get to some of these players, uh, my first question for you is, do the Cowboys have the best edge rusher room in the NFL? I mean, I I think it's a legitimate question, and and I think the answer is yes. I mean, I I think... You know, you've got you know two guys that uh, one who is maybe one of the best players in football, if not you know the best non-quarterback uh, playing in the game. I think a guy that you could certainly argue that in Micah Parsons, and then another guy who was a superstar in his own right, and Demarcus Lawrence uh, on the other side, uh, and that would be enough to kind of get you in the conversation. I think of of at least you know top five or 10 groups. But then on top of that, you also have uh, an incredible amount of depth. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a lot about Sam Williams and what we think about his future holds. You know, Dorrance Armstrong came in last year and just was very opportunistic eight and, uh, and was able to they, yeah. eight and a half sacks, which is just incredible coming off the bench. And then Dante Fowler was uh, another guy who was just able to kind of come off the bench and win at such a high rate, uh, despite getting so few snaps that the Cowboys defensive, uh, you know, at the edge room specifically, uh, just you know, attacked in waves, and even when Micah Parsons wasn't on the field, they were able to kind of produce pressure uh, f- from whatever combination they put out yep. there. So, I have a hard time thinking, especially if you're going to include you know depth into the equation, that any team has yes. uh, has better depth than the Cowboys at that position. It's the depth, and there's even guys that you didn't mention, like Chauncey yep. Golston, who we know is going to yep. play some snaps at defensive end. Junior Fahoku, who the Cowboys took in the fourth round this year, he's going to see some snaps as a bigger defensive end. It's the top end talent combined with the depth. It's really hard to find anybody that has, you know, five, you know, capable starters in a unit, but the Cowboys certainly do. Uh, Lena, let's talk about the, obviously the top tier guy here, Micah Parsons coming off another all pro season, 13 sacks last year. My question for you, and we were actually talking about this pre-show, but how much better do you think Micah Parsons can get? Because the the reason I ask is I was looking at some numbers from pro football focus today, and I'll just read them to you. 98th percentile pass rush grade, 97th percentile pass rush grade on true pass sets, 98th percentile pass rush grade without play action, 97 pass rush win rate. I mean, the, the numbers are just absolutely absurd. Is there a way that he could kind of pull away from the miles Garrett's and the Nick Bosa's and the TJ Watts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, whenever you're talking about guys in this range that are like, you know, I mean, you don't want to say generational player because <laughs> that term gets thrown around a lot. Um, but I think, you know, whatever you're talking about, you know, the top, top, top 1% of, of, of pass rushers, <clears throat> you know, comparing them to the other rest of the body of the NFL group is – uh, it's useful for kind of providing context, but at the same time, like these are the guys who are pushing the top of the envelope, right? These are the guys who are 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 showing you what the ceiling is for that kind of percentile of of, of NFL talent. So, I yeah, I think that not only can Micah get better, um, I think there's pretty clear areas where he can get better. His his technique is not perfect, and he's still a person who's learning how to rush the passer on a consistent basis. Is something that he's kind of developing. Um, yeah, you know, I think that there are he could be more uh, versatile as far as where he's rushing the passer and, and, and how he's rushing the passer. I mean, I think they've been deploying him a lot in a lot of different ways, but you still see him mostly attacking from the right side and, uh, you know, in, in certain ways. So I, I definitely think there is more to get out of Micah Parsons um, as as you know, as far as his effect on the field. Now, maybe he uh, uh, does this while uh, 
not getting, you know, massive amount of, of kind of track stats. I mean, maybe he never hits 20 sacks or Which whatever. I think is so overrated to begin with. Yeah. And I know that's what voters care about when it comes yeah. to like all pros and defensive player of the year awards. Like that's not what Dallas needs. Like they don't well, need all- him. They don't need him to get 20 sacks in a season. That's not even what Micah's working towards. You know, like no. Micah's Micah's got it right. Like Micah's working towards being a force that is a catalyst for everyone else on the defense yes. as well, right? That you have to focus all this attention on him because he's so good. Uh, and that be that that attention being focused on him obviously will kill you because Dorrance Armstrong goes remains unblocked and, and yes. gets a, a yes. attack for loss or whatever. So I think that's ultimately what he's trying to work towards. Uh in and in that and in the sense of where he can improve his game or can he improve his game. I think there's still room to go. I think he's still got some headroom above him a little bit, which is, I mean, absolutely terrifying for offensive yeah. tackles in the NFL. I, I think he can get better. And you mentioned the technique. Like, I think that's the the part of this that he could really improve. But I'm just going to harp on the sack thing again. Who do, yeah. who does everybody believe is the best defensive player of all time? You, I mean, this is pretty obvious, right? It's Lawrence Taylor, right? Lawrence Taylor, yeah. Do you know how many times Lawrence Taylor led the NFL in sacks? Hmm. <laughs> this once, is good. Once. Yeah. Right. Most I'm looking at the numbers here. Most of his career, it was uh, 11 and a half, 13, 12, 15, 15, 10, 7, 9, 9. Like the sack to- totals don't matter that much. If you're occupying double and triple teams, but you're the reason why your defense is top, you know, the top ranked unit in the NFL and you're creating opportunities for others and you're helping create turnovers and you're making timely plays. I don't think anybody's going to care about the sack totals. I really don't. Like, if the Cowboys' defense is number one in the league and Parsons has 12 and a half sacks, he's going to get consideration for, you know, the top defensive player in the league. So I think that's where Parsons is trying to really focus his attention on this. How do I make my teammates better and my defense better at the same time? I think Carl Banks' nearly 40 sack career will tell you exactly how good Lawrence Taylor was. I mean, uh, having someone like Lawrence Taylor opposite of you opens things up for everybody. And and I think it's a great example of, of, you know, how that they were able to leverage uh, uh, Lawrence Taylor's uh, talent uh, to kind of create a a great overall defense and not just uh, uh, exploit Lawrence Taylor's talent, but, but uh, you know, the, uh, Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick, uh, you know, at the time were on the staffs and, and they were able to use that talent to kind of provide for the entire defense. And I think that's what the Cowboys are trying to do here with Parsons as well is, hey, we've got a real freak here that that, that offense coordinators are terrified of. Yeah, let's use that as a cudgel against them and, and f- make them focus on on Parsons and then attack from the other it's side. Just how do they do that? Like, how do they how do they deploy Parsons to get the most value out of him? for the rest of the defense. Is it by moving him around? Is it by keeping him on one side? So def- or excuse me. So offenses really have to focus their attention and add extra blockers. That's what I'm curious to see. And I'm curious to see how Parsons reacts. Like if he goes yeah. a whole game getting doubled and triple teamed, is he going to get frustrated if he's not having success in the defense is I'm not suggesting that he's a diva or anything like that, but you know mm-hmm. how it is like, if it you're, be, it's if you're getting it's doubled, hard work, right? And we saw it was it last year or as a rookie when he got doubled and he got hit right in the chest and it kind of affected it and took the wind out of him. Like that's the part that I want to see. How does he overcome that? Yeah, and that's you know that's a big thing. He I think he's working on getting yeah. stronger, being able to fight through that sort of stuff. It's going to be an important part of the season for them. All right, let's talk about some of the other edge rushers on this roster, including a year two player who we all expect to make a leap next. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel because uh, baseball season is in full swing and there's no better place to get in on all the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, customers can get a new, no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That is up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, just go to FanDuel.com slash on to join today. You can bet on baseball every single day. We've got NFL futures. We've got NBA summer league. If you love basketball as much as I do. So don't miss your chance to snag a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. When you join FanDuel today, just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, the official partner of major league baseball. Welcome back to the Locked On Cowboys podcast. We want to thank you for making Locked On Cowboys your first listen every day. Every day is on tomorrow's show. We're going to talk about the interior guys. We're going to talk about uh, Mozzie Smith. 
What does OC Dig- Osa Digizua look like in year three? Some Chauncey Golson action. So make sure you tune in for that. Want to talk about Sam Williams. I think yeah. going into year two, everybody expects him to have a breakout year. What are you expecting from Williams? That's what I'm expecting. I mean, I think you saw last year just on limited snaps how how talented he was and uh, how capable he was. You know, it's funny because it, it's it it shouldn't have been such a surprise to us. I think you know, there's just a, and I think you saw a little bit of 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 why he you know kind of fell the way he did. I mean, he did have some maturity issues. You you look back into the the car accident and maybe what happened that night, and you hope that that isn't a sign of things to come and you hope that that's something that that he learned from but as far as his play on the field i mean he was a dominant player in the sec uh, he looked like a man amongst boys in a, in a college division that was the best of the best right uh and then he you know not, i guess it shouldn't have been that surprising that he was able to come into the league and then on limited snaps you know show really some really dominant play i mean there were definitely times when he was discarding folks getting in the back explosive field, you know i think that's the thing that jumps snaps. off yeah. right like yeah. he is just and there's some times where he gets in the backfield so quick. You're like, oh, is that yeah. Micah Parsons? Nope, mm-hmm. same Williams. He just looks like Micah Parsons yeah. a lot in the face. It's he crazy. Really does. If you guys have not seen pictures of Sam Williams and Micah Parsons like standing next to each other, it's it, they really do look like they could be brothers. They do. Um, but, uh, but but I think beyond that, too, the thing – we see a lot of explosive power, pass rushers come out, but the, I think the difference here is that Sam Williams is, is built like a grown man. Like He came into the league built like as a 255-pound-plus yeah. guy that was explosive like this. So – Honestly, like you just don't see a lot of guys with that kind of explosion and that kind of power fall the second round at edge rusher. A lot of it had to do with they weren't exactly sure what kind of person. So the Cowboys clearly have gotten a, a talented freak of nature athlete in there. And and I think that when you saw him on the field, you saw a lot of that. It was these tackles for loss, sacks, you know, big plays. I on limited snaps. Um, so I, I think you know, getting more opportunity to get on the field. Uh, and getting a, 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 an offseason to kind of learn again, second year jump guys. We talked about this, right? I, you know, we've been talking about Sam Williams making a big jump for a little while now because yep. we felt like that experience that he got last year was really important. It sounds like everything we've heard from him is that he really attacked this offseason and took it very seriously as well. The coaches have been raving about him. Um, this is a guy that, you know, we are kind of penciling in as the potential replacement for Demarcus Lawrence whenever he mm-hmm. wants to decide to walk away. And and I and as it stands right now, he looks to be well on trajectory to take that spot whenever it's time for D Law to step back. So a lot of times with these breakout players, Landon, they break out for a couple of reasons. Either one, like same system, they're just they know how to play it now. There's no changes. It's just a lot of continuity, no. which he has, right? Mm-hmm. Or there's a position change, right? And I would argue that Sam Williams made a position change from college to what he played in the NFL, playing in that frog stance at Ole Miss to being basically a stand-up outside linebacker. It's a change. And a lot of times in year two, you feel more comfortable, right? The other reason why you'll see when a player breaks out is they just get more snaps. And one thing we saw last year was when Sam Williams played, he was really good. I've got some numbers here for you. 71st percentile pass rush grade, 77th percentile pass rush grade without play action, 92nd percentile in run stop percentage. Sometimes when those guys just play more, they get better. And I've got a feeling that's probably going to be Sam Williams. I mean, he's got everything that you, that you want, you know, as a starting defensive end who can play. I mean, like we've mentioned, he's explosive. He's strong. He's, you know, he's developing as a, as an instinctual player. Uh, yeah, there's, it's all, all, all speed ahead for, for Sam Williams is, is if, if he can continue to, you know, develop the way he has p- continue on this track. Uh, I, you know, I expect big things from him. You know, I yep. mean, I think he, he could be a 10 sack guy. I mean, just, yep. just based on, on what we've Easy. seen of him in a snap, you know, like that, and especially opposite of Micah Parsons, this well, could be the guy that, that could really kind of be, you know, in two years from now, he could lead the lead, the team in, in in sacks because of all the opportunities provided. By yes, Parsons. if Parsons is going to have one of those years where he just gets doubled and tripled a bunch, and his sack totals kind of remain the same, but he's having a huge impact, it's probably going to benefit somebody like Sam Williams, who could yeah. he could play four hundred snaps and is easily get like eleven and a half sacks. Like that wouldn't be surprising at all. Now, the one player last year who did benefit a lot from Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence who we haven't really talked about yet, but we will. Um, mm-hmm. Dorrance Armstrong, eight and a half yeah. sacks, which was by far the most he had in his career. I'm a little bit 
not concerned, but I think that we're overrating his play from last year. I think the sack totals were really good. I don't think he played quite as well as he did in 2021, but we're going into the final year of his contract. What do you expect from Dorrance in what? We're going into year six now? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I think that what we saw last year from Dorrance Armstrong is is that's he's reached his his pinnacle, right? He's yeah. like that. I, I mean, maybe he gets better from that, and, and if he does, man, fantastic for us, right? Uh, and fantastic for his career. But I think you know, uh, look, this is a guy who came into the league at 20 years old, has been in the league for six years. He's still only 26 years old. It's crazy. I'm pretty sure. He, I don't think he's turned 27 yet. So no, uh, he he actually just turned 26 here in June. Okay, yeah. So he's just turned 26, just like a few weeks ago, uh, and had an eight and a half sacks last year. And look, obviously, a lot of it was uh, you know cleanup stuff. A lot and, of cleanup but that's sacks, yeah. that's that's fine. Like we're we're not necessarily needing more um, engines here. We we need folks who can who, who can finish things off. You know, when when the the, the disruption is produced by guys like Micah Parsons. And then on top of that, you know, look, we're not talking about special teams, but but, but Dorrance Armstrong is. By far one of our best special team well, players. And that's the thing is he if he's going to be your fourth defensive end, he's going to have to play a lot of special teams, which the Cowboys are clearly fine with because he's really good. So he's incredible. It, yeah. I think he's making six million this year, which is kind of just what like special teamers get on top of a guy that can give you, you know, he could eat 700 snaps on defense if you need him to. I mean, look, just look at what he did last year and tell me that it, that what we got wasn't an absolute steal. I mean, look, he had eight and a half sacks last year. I'm pretty sure he had a defensive touchdown and a special teams touchdown, a, 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 at least a one blocked kick. Uh, you know, Great out as PFF's uh, highest graded special teams player last year. Uh, on the Cowboys or in the, in no, all, no, in the league? <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty good deal, guys. Like for your fourth defensive. Like, I mean, really, he could be your fifth defensive in this year, honestly, yes. as far as pass rusher. So I, I guess it just shows you like that's the depth we're talking about is that you've got your fifth defensive end who's getting like fourth or fifth defensive end who's getting eight and a half sacks yes. and is the best special teamer in all of NF the NFL. I mean, that's the kind of depth the Cowboys are talking about at their edge right now. So it's a good place uh, to be. Let, let's just finish up here with Demarcus Lawrence before we move on. Um, yeah, we're going into years this year nine year 10 for i think, I think it might be year 10. 10 i think yeah it's year, year 10. 10 for demarcus lawrence still a really good player but i've got to believe that the cowboys are going to try to find ways to i don't want to say limit his snaps because that makes it sound like you can't have him on the field but monitor his snaps kind of over the season would you agree yeah i mean i think uh i think he he definitely as he starts to you know get a little bit older and and the, the thing is is that you know he's kind of moved away a little bit from the kind of a uh, uh, career, you know, uh, of of being on and off the injured reserve, like that was kind of like the middle part of his career, the late middle part of his career, was defined by almost a kind of Tyron Smith level of, yeah, we'll be thrilled to have him on the field when we have him on the field, right? Well, and then, it, and, but that was also a period when he was so being so overly relied oh upon gosh, that yeah. they had to put him yeah, on the field. He had to play. And, and in twenty twenty one, he just had a fluke injury. He broke his yeah, foot yeah. in practice like that. Yeah. I don't know how much that matters, like whether you're durable. But I, I mean, for the last what, last year and a half, whenever he's been on the field, he's been really effective. Yeah, and I think that that. that the real thing that's helped him out is all of what we've just talked about, the acquisitions they've made, right? The fact yeah. that they were so quickly able to get all this depth at the edge position um, seemingly overnight, right? And just in all kinds of weird combinations, right? They drafted a guy, they drafted two guys that one of their guys that they had had previously started to really start to develop. They signed a guy off the street. And then, and so Demarcus Lawrence suddenly was in a room where, Hey, I don't have to play you know, no. 800 snaps or whatever in order for the defense to be good. I, I could play, you know, rotational level snaps and, you know, but at such a high level that I'm still having a similar impact without, you know, also continually putting myself at risk for injury. And I agree. I think that's what the Cowboys will do. As you see the rise of Sam Williams, as you see DeMar uh, 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 Fowler come back, I mm -hmm. think it provides more opportunity to be a little bit more judicious with the way that you're using Lawrence. I mean, it's a 17 game season. You want him available for the most important parts of the season. Um, and, and I think that he is going to get a little bit more opportunity to kind of stay on the bench and, and stay healthy and just kind of maintain Be hopefully his health throughout the season. Right. Yeah, exactly. They need him on the field. Like this oh, isn't yeah. a situation where we're reeling him back. It's if anything, it's 
we need to protect our asset for when we need him the most. Yeah, it's and protecting we have young him guys from who can himself, play. right? Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, because exactly. I think if it was up to him, he would play eighty percent of the snaps <laughs> a game. But it's yeah. trying to make sure that he's healthy when you get into December and January. He's obviously not the same athlete he was in 2014. Like if you go watch that playoff game against the Lions, it's unbelievable how long and skinny and bendy he was. But what I love about him now is he's just he's transformed his game where. Man, he, his technique is so good. Go watch the Giants yeah. game on Monday Night Football last year where he was going against Evan Neal and just had his way with him because he's just so refined with his hand technique, his footwork. He's going to, even at this stage of his career, he's just going to win all those matchups against the guys that don't have, you know, that aren't technically sound. He might be the best run defender in all of football. Oh yeah. I mean, period. Yes. Like it just, you, you don't want to run at him because he's so, so dominant and, and, yes. and hand technique is a huge part of that, right? He just, he understands leverage. He understands how to get his hands free. Uh, and you see it with the pass rush. He's obviously famous for his cross chop. Uh, one of the best in the league. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, you've mentioned it. This is not a guy who uh, even when he came out in college, wasn't, you know, he wasn't Randy Gregory as far as no. that kind of athlete, right? He was never the the run underneath the table, bendy type guy. Like that just was never his thing. He, he learned to refine his body. He started out kind of getting really big. Then he slimmed out a little bit, and, and but kept his kind of, you know, normal size. So he got down to like 265-ish, I guess, 260. Yep. Uh, and, and since then, which, which he did like, I guess, two or three years ago, I mean, he's just he's reached another level with this game because he's a little bit quicker. Um, he still has the power and he still obviously has kind of continued to grow as a hand technician. Yep. Um, he's just on a per snap basis. So, so dangerous. And then that's not even mentioning how he's developed as an interior pass rusher too, is his ability to kind of reduce down and, and play some uh, three technique on pass rushing situations as well. Like, Demarcus Lawrence is a guy that's always been underrated on the Cowboys defense. And just go back and look yep, at Twitter forever. from three or four years ago. Uh, but I think this is, we're really starting to see, you know, who he is to this team, not only as a run defender, but just as a limited access, but, but just filled with dynamite, you know, kind of playmaker on the edge that can be deployed, you know, in a couple of different ways and all of them will be pretty successful. All right, let's talk about the down the roster defensive ends on this team next on this episode of the Locked On Cowboys podcast. All right, we are finishing up here on the Locked On Cowboys podcast talking about the down the roster defensive ends. We've got Dante Fowler, there's Chauncey Golston, who's going to be splitting time at defensive end and defensive tackle, Junior Fahoku. They signed Isaiah Land, who's going to be playing linebacker and edge rusher. <laughs> They have Tyrus Wheat. Who do you think is going to be the odd man out here? Because it does feel like they're probably going to have to move on from somebody. I mean, the, the undrafted rookies might not just make the team, but do you think there's a chance like Fowler or Armstrong just don't make this team? Maybe, but I honestly think that they will try to find a way to keep those guys on the team. And 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 unless you got one of these guys that comes in and really just just blows up the training camp and, and you just can't keep off the roster uh, it, because you can't find a way to hold on to them through some other roster mechanism, right? Um, it feels I, like they'll go light at interior defensive line of anything, right? Like yeah. keep five edge rushers and then maybe just five defensive tackles, right? You. <laughs> Mozzie, yeah. Osa, Hankins, Golston, Fahoku. Yeah, it's funny because again, the guy that I'm cutting for this is is uh, Gallimore. I mean, it's yeah. just like, yeah, you just take one less defensive tackle. Know that you've got some defensive tackles in your defensive end room, and then uh, and then go go play football. And, and I think that's at least what will likely happen coming out of training camp, right? And and I think that that's the thing is that you may see that room change a little bit, probably more on the interior side to kind of facilitate what's happening on the outside. But uh, to me, the engine of this defense is the edge class, is okay. the edge room. So you're really kind of building the roster to kind of support around that, especially at the defensive tackle spot. I think now that they've got Mozzie and Hankins uh, and Osa, they've got a core three that they like. Uh, and then they've got you know, two of these other guys that are defensive in Heichel hybrids and, and Golson and, and, yep. and Fahoku. So they'll find a way to cobble together the defensive tackle position with good talent. 
uh, but without having to ro- uh, use a whole roster spots yep. on like you know a fourth and fifth defensive tackle. I will say it, it might just depend on what the undrafted free agents do. Like if the Cowboys, yep. I'm just going to use a name, Tyus Wheat, who they signed from Mississippi State. If he looks really good, and it's like, hey, Dorrance is better right now, but maybe a year from now it's close. We could get a fifth round pick and move off of his contract. That's where I could see the Cowboys potentially entertaining an idea, but uh, to trade one of those guys, but it would have to be somebody would really have to impress not only for like a couple of weeks, but like all through training camp, yeah. all through the preseason. And you got to feel pretty confident that that guy can contribute right away. Yeah. This isn't a, you're not trading Dorrance Armstrong. If you know, Tyrus Wheat gets two sacks in the first week of practice, like you got to go out and prove it's, it week in and week be out. We're going to have drum beat, right? Yeah. And I think that the other thing too, is that, you know, the, these guys have value. So you you may not even be talking about cutting this. So it, it may actually be more of a case where people start getting on the phone and start calling about Doris Armstrong or ca- start calling about Dante. And, and that's the thing is, uh, is and, especially and, and, if there's you know, injuries at other positions, yeah. because they'll, they'll look at Dallas's depth chart. Like, okay. Parsons, Lawrence, Sam Williams. Hey, Dorrance Armstrong. He's, he's eight and a half sacks it. last year. Can we get him for a six round pick? Or yeah. can we trade him for uh, another player that the Cowboys That's might right. have? Like if the you know if the left guard or yeah, exactly. Like uh, if the Cowboys have an injury or something, you know, like yeah. there could be a potential that, that, that they could trade. So it, it's 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 great to have all these assets. You probably have more than you could take to the game day roster on week one. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're not necessarily gonna hold on to them all the way through training camp to see what you can get for some of these guys. Down, and and down we saw down. this happen last year, right? There they left some pretty good defensive ends either on the game day inactive. They had to cut Terrell Basham last year, who I still think is a good player. He's still, yeah, I mean, I do. He, he was a quality defensive end. They, they just had to outright cut because they had too many guys. I don't think that'll be the case this year. Cause it does feel like they have a core five that they can keep and play and find different ways to utilize those guys. Yeah. But if you're looking at like what position on the Cowboys is the strongest, it's hard not to think that edge rusher, is at the very, very top of the list. Yeah, the Dallas defense is going to be one of the top units in the league, if if not the top unit uh, when it's all said and done. And and the defensive end room, the edge group, is obviously yeah. the straw that stirs the drink here. All right, that is it for today's show. We want to thank you for making Locked On Cowboys your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Go check out our show on YouTube, Locked On Cowboys. Go follow Landon on Twitter, at McCoolBCB. I'm at Marcus underscore Mosier. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.